Okay. So, um, again, uh, how, how many of you, how often are students hospitalized, psychiatric hospitalization, in your schools? Mm -hmm. yeah, a couple times a what? A year. A year. And that's, and that's pretty standard. So um, this came up as a topic, and again, it's not happening every day, um, but it's nice that it's coming up because when it does happen, it's pretty important. So the topic that was requested was helping students transition back to school um, after hospitalization. And I expanded it a little bit to um, include some additional cases. So psychiatric hospitalization, fifth floor hospitalization is one of these occasions. Um, but there are also occasions when kids end up in, in uh, inpatient treatment for substance abuse, where kids will in, end up at uh, Boys and Girls Town for a residential stay or some other level of, of higher care, um, and then will come back to the school system. Yes. But we see, I didn't know there was a DL site in Sydney, I could have stayed there. Um, but what we see is when our kids are hospitalized, either because of drugs and alcohol or the mental health, is we get no notification that they're coming back into our district. Just boom, they're there at 8 o'clock yep. in the morning, and it's like, whoa. Yep, and that's exactly um, what we're going to be talking about is, and again, there's some of this stuff that you guys as individuals within a school system might think about, but, but to a larger extent, this is a systemic change that needs to happen. And so there are some recommendations for how we need to, as school systems and as ESUs, make policy um, to address this issue, because really it is bigger than any one classroom teacher or, um, or special education coordinator. Um, typically, reasons for inpatient care um, are uh, suicidality. So a child has been found, a youth has been found to be at high risk of harm to themselves. Um, uh, homicidality, high risk of harm to others. Now, just those things in and of themselves do not automatically result in hospitalization. So most of you are probably familiar with the crisis teams that exist in your communities. So what will typically happen if a, if a, a youth is expressing suicidal intent, suicidal thought, is that they might end up in an emergency room, for example. And our area has a pretty standard policy then on what happens next, which is the local community crisis team is called in to evaluate that that individual and determine if they are in fact um, at risk to themselves or others. Um, and that typically involves, um, can that individual be made safe with less intensive means? So yes, they're having suicidal ideation, but do they have active ideation? Do they have a plan? Do they have the means to carry out the plan? Do they have intent to carry out the plan? Can they contract with a responsible person not to take steps to follow out that plan, um, and are there protective factors, um, a safety plan that can be made, uh, that can be brought on board to keep that individual safe without sending them to the hospital. If those criteria cannot be met, then they tend to be hospitalized either as a voluntary hospitalization or in what's called an EPC status for emergency protective custody. In our area, I, in some areas of the country, and even in some areas of the state, an EPC hospitalization might be five to seven days. How long is it typically in our area? One or two. Yeah, yep, one or two. Um, we used to joke that sometimes when we had to be part of that crisis team, the, the client would make it home before we did, you know? So a day or two is, is, is quite common in our area. Um, substance abuse treatment is another inpatient care. Um, also sometimes, although less often, students will be hospitalized due to psychosis. So a sudden onset of a delusional state or, or, or psychotic symptoms, hallucinations might result in hospitalization. Um, also sometimes, and this falls more under the um, harm to others usually, but severe, severe behavior problems may sometimes result in youth being taken into a behavioral health unit temporarily. When I asked you guys and you said maybe this comes up a couple of times a year, I think that's uh, fairly common. It's not, it's not a terribly, terribly common uh, phenomenon uh, at all. A 2011 study showed that there's been an increase in um, adolescent hospitalizations, but it still only um, means about 1% of high school students. So, so it's, not, it's not a huge, huge issue, but obviously it's a high intensity issue when it happens. 
So what you should know, while rates of hospitalization have increased over time, lengths of stays have decreased due to managed care, um, third-party payers, those kinds of issues. So it's happening more, the need is higher, but we're not keeping kids in there as long. What that means is that hospitalizations tend to be acute only. They're for immediate stabilization. And so that means that students are often returning to you guys before they're really out of crisis at all. They're still at risk. It's very common for rehospitalization to occur fairly shortly for that reason. Um, also, students are so vulnerable um, that they're at higher risk during that time for dropouts. Um, and also social isolation is a real risk due to the stigma. Many of our communities, I mean, this is all confidential, right? There's all these HIPAA rules that come into play, and we are all very careful as educators about privacy issues. And still, everybody knows when you've been hospitalized. And so there are real stigma issues.